It's the spring of 1997. Somewhere in the dingy back rooms of the Hendrick Motorsports race shop in Charlotte, engineer Rex Stump and several other secretive crew members are brainstorming an idea to build the perfect NASCAR race car. After winning the Winston Cup Championship in 1995 and scoring 10 wins in 1996, crew chief Ray Evernham and driver Jeff Gordon are looking for new ways to keep a hold on their advantage. As Stump later said, Jeff was winning with anything. I think you could have built a grocery cart and he could have won with it. That's tough to beat. The object wasn't to beat the competition, it was to beat what we had. Hendrick has always had great people and ran a first class operation, but in the quickly evolving world of 1990s NASCAR, they must remain steadfast in their approach. Any hint of complacency and the opposition will pounce. Dale Earnhardt, Mark Martin, Rusty Wallace, and Dale Jarrett, amongst others, will bring the fight. The upcoming Winston All-Star Race gives each team a chance to perhaps try out new things, taking the opportunity of a non-points race to go for broke and learn something new for the following week's Coca-Cola 600. The 1997 running of the Winston would have long-lasting effects, more than any other edition of that event. Because Ray Evernham and the Hendrick crew would bring a car to that race that caused an entire rewrite of the NASCAR rulebook and completely changed the mindset of NASCAR when it comes to rules packages moving forward. This is the story of a car nicknamed T-Rex, a fitting name for such a force of nature. If you watch NASCAR today, or really any top-level motorsport, you know that the name of the game is aerodynamics. Manipulating airflow to generate downforce while minimizing drag, however that may be accomplished, is the never-ending cat-and-mouse game in auto racing. But back in pre-2000 stock car racing, a lot of what made a quick stock car was maximizing mechanical grip. If you were a stock car racer at any level, from the local short track up to the Cup Series, you'd best make sure you had an A-plus chassis guy in your corner. But around this time, the best chassis guys in the business had already sort of perfected weight transfer and balance, so it was up to them to figure out how to make aero gains using the chassis itself, rather than just through the body of the car. Obviously, even all these years later, Evernham and Stump are reluctant to divulge too many details about their creation. The trick, so to speak, behind T-Rex was building the chassis in such a way that allowed it to more or less land in the corner, sealing the underbody to the ground, creating a sort of ground effect that you would see in Formula 1 cars today. It began with bigger frame rails that made the chassis more resistant to twisting forces as it went around the track. Evernham said, Everything was raised so that when you drop the nose, it created negative pressure under the car. So you might be asking yourself, what made this car able to pass inspection? Well, Hendrick Motorsports has always been a team willing to push the boundaries on the gray area of the rulebook. It's often said in racing, if you ain't cheating, you ain't winning. However, Hendrick by this point was often willing to tell NASCAR what they were up to so they could make sure what they brought to the track would actually pass inspection and not create a headache for everyone involved. But when the 24 car rolled off the hauler at Charlotte in May of 97, it didn't take long for members of other teams to notice something was clearly off. The rumblings around the garage area began to grow. The valence was pretty high up off the ground, Stump said. You'd walk down and see all the other cars' valences three and a half or four inches off the ground, and this one was five and a half or six inches. These guys in the garage are professionals, and they would have noticed. Sporting a paint scheme sponsored by Jurassic Park, and being the brainchild of one Rex Stump, it was only fitting to name it T-Rex before it ever turned a lap in anger. This car was sure to bring something unique to the All-Star Race. After messing up his qualifying run, Gordon would open the first segment in 19th, but at the end of the 30-lap stint, he was up to third. For segment two, the field would be inverted for another 30-lapper, and this time Gordon went from 16th to fourth. In the final 10-lap segment, it took Gordon just a lap and a half to go from 4th to 1st, and with clean air on the nose, he pulled away and didn't look back. I just remember that car being stuck to the track in a way that I had never felt a car be stuck before, Gordon said. It just gave me confidence, and it was fast, it was awesome. Years later, he said, we killed them, it was ridiculous. The famous story that has passed around is that after the race, Evernham and Rick Hendrick were called to the hauler by Bill France Jr were promptly told that the car would no longer be legal and to not bring it back to the racetrack. NASCAR had known about the car and its development, saw what it was capable of, especially in the hands of someone like Gordon and Ray Evernham, and decided no more. Before the following week's Coca-Cola 600, NASCAR inspectors actually showed up at Hendrick Motorsports 
and thoroughly inspected T-Rex. We asked them to tell us what was wrong with it, Stump said. Maybe that was a mistake, because they spent a good bit of time really looking at the car. Then they went back and wrote a whole bunch of new rules that basically outlawed it. The other car owners looked at it, and they all whined and flipped out and said, We'll have to build all new cars, Evernham said. Everybody panicked. It's easier to kill Frankenstein than it is to figure out how to get along with him. From NASCAR's point of view, Gary Nelson said, As caretakers of the sport, NASCAR's responsibility is to prevent car owners from having to constantly chase things like that. We don't want them to have to throw out everything they have because we didn't recognize something soon enough. By letting us come over to examine the car closely, that helped us to write more definitive rules. That way, only one car was affected. Evernham admits that NASCAR was correct on this point because it saved Hendrick Motorsports from having to replace their entire fleet of equipment with new technology applied from what was on the T-Rex car. We were trying to win championships and do things different and it was like, do we want to fight this battle and give up everything else, or do we give up on this one and go on? I know Rex took that hard because it was his baby. I didn't like it at all, and I still don't, but they didn't want the car, bottom line, and you have to pick your fights, he said. Rick Hendrick was not surprised, nor was he angry about the fact that rival teams got in NASCAR's ear to do something. I would have done the same thing, he said. That's the unique deal in this garage area. You're either going to do what other teams are doing, or you're going to turn them in. It's clear from what Nelson said that NASCAR was trying to protect the teams from going on a huge out-of-control spending spree trying to chase the gains that Hendrick had made with T-Rex. NASCAR has always been more willing than other racing series to close gaps between teams in an effort to enhance the show, and I think that the case of T-Rex led us to where we are now, where more or less every team has the same base equipment, and it's up to their engineers to pull something tricky off without being noticed. With the current series using virtually spec equipment, a lot of fans long for the days when creativity was rife. All the way down the line from Smokey Eunuch to Junior Johnson, onto the tricks that the Rainbow Warriors were pulling off in the 90s, stock car racing has always been about ingenuity to get a leg up on the competition. Only six years after T-Rex's lone showcase, NASCAR would move to common templates in an attempt at fairness, making each manufacturer look more or less the same until the introduction of the Gen 6 car in 2013, which was only a difference in body style, a philosophy carried over to the next gen car. They're all the same underneath, just with a specially designed Chevy, Ford, or Toyota body shell over it. That's not to say some funny business isn't still happening heading into 2024. The big teams in the sport are still coming up with new and clever ideas to gain an advantage. You just probably can't see them with the naked eye. In any case, no single race car in NASCAR history did more to rewrite the rule book than did T-Rex. Ever since, for better or for worse, NASCAR has cracked down on radical new philosophies in favor of maintaining some semblance of competitive balance. For that reason, T-Rex's legacy is secured as the car that broke NASCAR.